Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this first session of critical issues facing the higher education sector um, hosted by eConsult Solutions Incorporated. My name is Lee Huang, president of the firm. I am joined this afternoon by one of our senior advisors uh, and a professional at KPMG, Adam Glazer. Hello, how are you? Hi, Adam. Uh, ESI has long been an advocate for and thought leader in the higher education industry. We have conducted over 60 economic impact studies for universities since 2017 and have provided substantive guidance on such issues as supplier diversity, social impact, and government relations. In April of 2020, we hosted a webinar series on critical issues facing the higher education sector, a series conceived prior to COVID and executed in the pandemic's earliest weeks, lending urgency to the coverage. And here we are three years later um, in April of 2023, and we are uh, here in the first of eight webinars that will feature new industry experts and topics of contemporary interest. Today's session is called Campus 2.0, Creating Lifelong Engagement with Alumni. I'm so glad that you could join uh, audience members. I believe the chat function has been enabled so that you can post questions and comments throughout, which I, as the moderator, will take responsibility to keep tabs on and integrate into our brief discussion. As noted, I am joined today by Adam Glazer from KPMG. Uh, Adam uh, specializes in design and placemaking for innovators, entrepreneurs, and university corporate partnerships. His, focus, his work focuses on the convergence of higher education, next-generation workplaces, and innovation-centered urban design. Adam has led significant innovation projects for, the, for UNC Chapel Hill, UC Berkeley, Penn State, Cortex, Wake Forest, and University City Science Center, along with a new university district in Chula Vista, California. He has also completed over a billion dollars of new construction for life science enterprises, including Amgen, Wyeth, and MedImmune. Adam served as chief design officer for Benjamin's Desk slash 1776, a startup co-working incubator, which grew from 3,000 square feet to over 200,000 square feet during his tenure to include key innovation hubs in Philadelphia and Washington. Adam, uh, glad to have you join this first webinar session. And as the topic is Campus 2.0, uh, this is a moniker that you coined. So I'd like you to start by um, telling us a little bit about what is Campus 2.0 and why is it on the rise right now? Well, thanks, Lee. And it's really great to be here, you all. Um, my camera is not working, so you get to see the logo. You don't get to see me, but that, that may not be so bad. Um, it's really great to be here. Uh, we evolved the Campus 2.0 uh, framework in response to what we see as the future trends in higher education that our clients have been facing over the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, we've been seeing schools really wanting to get much more involved in lifelong learning and engagement with their alumni, very interested in the nature of the business model of how higher education is, is evolving and, and really the geography. And so we, we have a mantra that, that in going forward, higher education will be lifelong, subscription-based, and distributed over a, a branded network of global spaces. And to that end, we're very interested in how we use shared work models and innovation district models to, to really embrace the entire student population. And our, our vision is that going forward, schools will, will basically project out over the next uh, 50 years or so a, a network of branded spaces that are, are not only academic in nature, but partnership driven, connected to all sorts of stages of life, all sorts of types of employment, and ultimately the communities themselves. And so uh, if you're familiar with Onondaga's model of the 15 minute city, we sort of feel that the university will always have a campus. It will always have edges that it, it, it sort of drives through partnerships, and then it'll really influence that 15 minute city around it. And uh, we're just now kicking off a project with Bloomington, Indiana, where it's fascinating seeing Bloomington wanting to you know, leverage these ideas to create a kind of a lifelong place that maybe it hadn't in the past, uh, but they also apply to cities as well. And uh, our, our feeling is that going forward, schools will, will really make these types of ideas part of their strategic plan. 
Adam, we have a lot of uh, university administrators and folks who work with it, at university administrators. So help us to understand in these complex uh, uh, institutions, you must have to interface with lots of different departments, lots of different parts of a university. So what tend to be the entry points? What tend to be the different parts of the universities that this topic touches? And how do you bring them all together around this vision? Well, that's a great question, Lee. Uh, we, we typically work with the innovation teams at universities, and it, it often starts as the idea of how do I grow more innovation in my ecosystem? How do I support startups? How do I drive corporate partnerships? And what we find is that playbook can be expanded to, to take, take on a much greater role in the, in, the, in the institution. And what I'm finding in the last five years is that, that while we enter the institution through, through the innovation team, we typically often get elevated very quickly to the provost who sees this as part of, of her or his uh, vision of how we, we train folks. Uh, presidents tend to really like the vision because it really speaks to economic development, social equity. But what's fascinating is the development folks and alumni engagement. I work with a lot of institutions that have, have an older model where you pick a, a, a small segment of the population that consistently gives to the institution. And what I think the development folks are realizing is that there's a membership model where an institution's alumni become you know, almost a sort of crowdfunding source for ideas, for, for, uh, for different types of investments, but in particular participation. And so I think it starts with the innovation folks and it very quickly expands. And I think where the, the, the rubber hits the sidewalk since I, I don't drive uh, is really focusing on uh, the alumni engagement and, and that team. Can you take us through a specific example just so we can see how this is playing out in real time? Absolutely. So, so Lee, what was this, 2018, Lee, I think you hosted a fantastic event uh, that we had at the UIDA conference in Milwaukee. And it's, it's sort of, a, I wish we could do that more, Lee, because I mean, we've now have three projects that have come from that. That was but, a lot uh, of fun. That was a lot of fun. But uh, right after the event, uh, Michelle Bolas, who is, is, is leads Innovate Carolina for UNC Chapel Hill, came forward said, I love these ideas because it's a story that we can tell to our community, to our students, to our faculty about how the institution can evolve. Uh, Chapel Hill had been struggling. Uh, it had always been sort of the jewel in the crown. And then with the rise of Raleigh and particularly Durham, I think people were startled that Durham had always sort of been seen as the short leg of the, the stool, if you will. And it has turned into a fantastic place that, that's starting to rival Austin for uh, you know, VC funding, quality of life, and Chapel Hill was like, well, what about us? And so we worked with them for a period of time and basically helped them assess kind of their innovation ecosystem, look very carefully at the downtown. And what, what really jumped out is that if, at that time, uh, right before COVID, if you graduated from UNC Chapel Hill and wanted to stay in Chapel Hill, you had two barriers to entry. One was the property values of Orange County were exceedingly high, you know, half a million dollar houses or more. But the bigger issue was employment. They're just, they're simply without working at the university or in support of the university, there simply weren't jobs. So in the course of that work, we began helping them negotiate with a, a, an alumni developer a complex that now is, is, is approaching four buildings. It was a fantastic development company, you know, Tar Heel, you know, through and through. He basically said, would you be interested in taking a floor of one of our buildings as a sign of good faith? Uh, Innovate Carolina said, what do you think? I said, I, I think that I wouldn't do that. They seemed relieved and I said, I think you should take the entire thing. And so we built a business model based on the work I did at Penovation basically said we can activate this building that triggered land swaps that led to a consolidated transportation center which then freed up a, a second garage site to now become a, a really key stem building other sites have become residential and we suddenly have built in the opportunity zone there this incredible core of activities and what's terrific about it lee is that suddenly Biolabs is in there, Innovate Carolina. I mean, employers who have been very active in Raleigh and Durham are now coming to Chapel Hill. And one of the interesting things about Chapel Hill is when you actually look at the JLabs cohort, for instance, eight of the 10 are actually coming from UNC. 
but they're going to Durham because Duke and Durham had the foresight to build the facility. So what we're doing is creating seats for employment. And I think when the STEM building opens, uh, what's really exciting is Longfellow out of Boston just announced that they're looking at a two acre site. And that's really how you do it. And that's what we're hoping to do in Bloomington. We've done this in Athens, Georgia. Uh, it's just fascinating to see once the ball starts rolling, people put two and two together, and then you can actually go back to Durham and say, this is, the, they did it, we can do it too. Uh, for those who are just joining, my name is Lee Huang, president of eConsult Solutions. I'm joined today by Adam Glazer from KPMG. Uh, you are hearing uh, him, but not seeing him due to some uh, uh, video issues. Uh, I guess mine is the face made for radio, but somehow uh, Adam isn't able to be <laughs> featured. Uh, but <laughs> the voice of God is played by Adam today. And uh, we're talking about Campus 2.0, creating lifelong engagement with alumni. Uh, there's a question in the chat, Adam, around uh, uh, that I want to kind of back into uh, around yeah. this landscape of closures, particularly uh, uh, among smaller colleges. And to kind of back into that question, can you talk about the extent to which Campus 2.0 is the same or different as you go through the landscape of big school, small school, urban school, rural school, STEM, liberal arts? I I imagine that your model scales to all of those types, but may look different. So maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Well, Lee, I think that's really well put. Um, the model in the sense that it's the toolkit is the same. I, I don't know if you all work in color, but if you, if you, if I'm a graphic person among other things. So there's RGB and you, it's the different proportions that create the colors, but it's always RGB. So uh, in our case, I think that, you know, the, the components are always the same, but they are very different based on, on the types of schools. If you're working with an R1 private, like a Penn, um, you know, their, their sets of issues are fundamentally different. I do a lot of work with public R1s, particularly land grant schools. Their issues are very different because they have different drivers, different governance structures, but many of the same issues are the same. We have alumni that are looking have a fundamentally different kind of career path, support, what have you. We might want to get into research. When you go down into, I call them the geography schools. You know, I grew up in Bowling Green, Kentucky. We had Western Kentucky University. You know, you, you might have been you know, Eastern Illinois or you know, Southern New Hampshire. I mean, these are schools that 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 played a distributive role of getting education to folks before the internet, before you know, the kind of the world as we see it. Those schools are fascinating because I still think there's a key fundamental physical and social component to being in education. Absolutely, if you're, you're studying sort of rote learning, by all means, do that online. But, but if you're interested in entrepreneurship, anything that's tied to social skills, particularly things where your employment is, is tied to social skills, you still need to show up. And I think where, where, where this is really interesting is these distributed schools. I'm thinking, Lee, about the Pashi schools, for instance, right? They still play a really critical role. I think it's more of a governance and financial model. And we've talked a lot. I think someone in the chat talked about increased m and uh, You know, I think you are going to see a lot of people wanting to sort of figure out how can I connect all these institutions under both a brand and a distributed business model, and how can they provide reciprocity? You know, one of the things we're looking at for Bloomington, Indiana, is, you know, before 2000, entrepreneurship was a fairly small thing. People were studying very classic education topics where going to a great school was going to a great school. Now, with people being far more interactive, but people being tied to entrepreneurship, people being tied to experiential learning, a city like a Bloomington or a state college is at a disadvantage because it's not putting you into an ecosystem. And ironically, I'm sitting in Cornell Tech right now, and Cornell Tech is a great example of Campus 2.0, where you know Ithaca was just not a place to start a company. It was not a place to to be in that kind of wind, if you will. So they made a concerted effort to come into New York City. They stopped just short uh, on Roosevelt Island, but. But the bottom line is they made that decision to get their community and their brand into a ecosystem that supported the future. I think these other schools will do that with reciprocity. You know, Cornell's not moving from Ithaca, but Cornell's saying, if you want to study Sanskrit, by all means, if you want to be an entrepreneur, we've got you covered. I think a lot of these other schools can do that as well. And, uh, and to me, the key thing is corporate employment 
I'm seeing corporations, I'm working with a number of them now that want to distribute educational opportunities uh, or, or employment opportunities. I think these remote schools can play a really different role in supporting that process and helping to monetize it so those schools are sustainable. Yeah, a strong connection to the ongoing conversation around the future of work and where it lives and all of that. I want to come back to a point that you made. And by the way, audience members, feel free to put questions in the chat. I'd rather take your questions, uh, although selfishly I have brimming, I'm always brimming with questions, uh, Adam, when you and I get together. You mentioned uh, bringing the business community onto campus, and that's something that I wanted you to explore a little bit further. And in particular, you really impressed upon me when we first met and you were in the co-working space, um, which has obviously evolved over time, uh, that there's a very powerful model to have thematic uh, organized co-working space wrapped with corporate presence. And I know that you've done that to great effect uh, all over the country. Um, is that part of this Campus 2.0 model is to, is to think uh, not just about general space and engagement with alumni, but kind of industry track it and think strategically about corporations or small businesses that want to be proximate um, to, to those spaces? Yes, yeah, and that's a great question too, Lee. Um, well, and, and I think there are two things that are embedded in that question. So the first one, uh, we've done a lot of grant funded research in places like Kendall Square. I was very involved in a lot of the Brookings Institute sites, both at Cortex and then ultimately the Science Center in West Philadelphia. And initially, there were, you see those Venn diagrams where there's the university, the company, corporation, and the, and the, the city or the community. What's interesting is we started doing some work with Google and Google's chief people person talked about how when Google got to a point where they'd saturated Mountain View, the CEO looked around the table and said, where did you all go to school? And if you look at Google's distributed geography, it began with the first person said Carnegie Mellon, boom, Bakery Square. Next person said MIT, boom, Kendall Square. And so what you begin realizing is that in a lot of cases, corporate relationships are alumni relationships. It doesn't mean they're exclusively so, but it's amazing to me how when you do digging beneath who are the key employers of a school, there's a strong nexus between the alumni community and that, especially for tech schools like Carnegie Mellon, MIT, you know, RPI, groups like that. So, so in some respects, to me, being an entrepreneur in a startup and going into an incubator is actually a form of, of uh, graduate alumni engagement. Doing the same thing with corporate partnerships is that way, doing the same thing with distributed employment. And when we began doing our work with UNC, we would have some very simple questions. We'd talk to a target company and we'd say, you can co-locate employment, uh, which a lot of people do. That uh, UIUC does that, for instance, with Motorola. You can co-locate research programs. So say, Lee, you're a PI at UNC. I'm you know, the head of a tech company. I wanna be able to work with you, but you wanna be where you are. You wanna recruit students irrespective of whether you're employing them. And the other thing that's interesting, I, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm an urbanist at heart. I walk everywhere I go, but I'm fascinated by how people deal with commuter patterns. So one of the other things we said is Chapel Hill is a really cool place to live. This is before COVID. What would it mean if people could work a day or two from Chapel Hill, whether they did it because they thought it was cool or because they lived there and didn't want, you know, an hour commute to Raleigh. And when we would present that to folks, they go, you know, all four and what took you so long. So I think corporations will always have a kind of core place, but the smarter corporations I'm meeting are trying to find how to distribute people, and that doesn't mean workstations, it doesn't mean people sitting there doing timesheets, it means how do I create meaningful impact with where my talent comes from, where my ideas come from, and my ability to grow and scale a company. And I think institutions are adjusting, you know, to, to pick on UNC a little bit, my co my colleagues there were, were interesting, they were talking to the, the leadership team, the leadership team said entrepreneurship's great, but how important is it? Is, is it really? So they did comprehensive studies. They found 50% of the students attending there think that at one point in their lives will start a company. And 75% of them thought that they needed entrepreneurial skills to thrive in a 21st century economy. And the day after I got that statistic, I was giving a talk in Santiago, a virtual talk. I like Santiago, but it was not to be with COVID. 
And uh, I was talking to these folks in Chile and their response was, I'm surprised the numbers are that low. So we're seeing a sea change in the way people see their lives and how they see geography. And I think institutions can not only play a convening function, but they can play a hosting function uh, that, that as an urban designer to me is like really vital to all the ESP goals and things that we're all, all, all shooting for. Adam, we've got some uh, real estate experts uh, in the room in our audience, uh, whether they are employed by universities or serve universities as professional service providers. I wonder if you could geek out a little bit on how the numbers play out. Um, don't get into the weeds, but you know, maybe dive down to <laughs> 10,000 foot altitude. You know, you've really um, uh, instructed me on kind of the traditionally how does uh, some with real estate in their portfolio think about uh, a campus building versus how they might think about it in a campus campus 2.0 format. So if you could take us uh, into the, into that altitude a little bit. Well, surely, you know, one of the things that started happening about 10 years ago is I, I've been working in higher ed for the last 25 years. And about 10 years ago, almost every single client would come in and say, talk to me about co-working. And I was like, well, why? They like, like whether it was they thought they should have it, whether they'd seen an incubator that used it, what have you, they, they, suddenly they were starting to get really interested in this model. So I, um, I'm a real believer, and if you want to learn something, do it. So around that time, I'd been commuting to Washington, and I had been working in Benjamin's desk just to try it out. Um, I, I do a lot of PowerPoints. Uh, I'm happy to share some of my decks at some point with you all if you're interested, but I, I was preparing one for UOI showed it to, to the folks at BD and they said, do you want to start a business with, with us? So we evolved an incubator that, that really was looking at ultimately how to, how to service the higher education market. And for those of you who know co-working, it revolves around something called the lease arbitrage. You lease space, you then reconfigure it, you resell the space, if you will, from a B2B transaction to a B2C transaction. And at, at base case, it makes two times the revenue um, that, that, that you're paying in rent or else you go out of business. But with academic clients, with membership models, business plus sub services, that can be two, four, six. It's incredible. So as I began evolving that, I realized that, that, that the companies that we all know, like specifically we work, were in the supply business. We, they would raise money, rent space, and go out and sell it. It was like a micro, micro uh, brokerage. And what I realized was institutions can aggregate demand. So we call it a talent shed, but we use LinkedIn data. And we basically scrape the LinkedIn data to, to create an addressable market for seats, impact memberships for a school, and then use that as the base case for building a mixed use community on the edges of, of the campus. Um, I still haven't seen too many people wanna move into the campus, but I, I give it time. I mean, after COVID, everything you don't think will happen will happen, right? So. But what's fascinating is it allows schools to potentially raise significant amounts of surplus revenue that they can put back into scholarships, endowments, operating funds. It's something you can use to finance the building. So in the case you're doing the building and you don't have a ton of resources to go to real estate, you can leverage that. And I think the reason that's important is, is as a person who's been in the innovation space now for about 25 years, uh, I have a rule, bad things happen for good reasons. I don't mean that like the hobbits won and the orcs lost or anything. I mean it in the sense that economically, it makes perfect sense why this happens over and over again. And my corollary to that is it's always the money. So having been involved in dozens of innovation districts, you have to figure out the money and at a molecular level that really comes down to seats and how individuals play in that ecosystem. And I think this is a way to take that out of the equation so that you can really focus on what you want to do, which is, is your core mission and growing your, your talent. That's a good segue to my last question uh, before we adjourn. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, a lot of schools are struggling financially, uh, may feel like, well, this is nice, but I've got to stabilize first before I can get creative like this. And I think a through line for your comments this afternoon is that this is how you have to address your um, financial situation. And so with that, you know, you've kind of presented the upside of catching this trend. What's the downside of this trend happens and you as a university are, are kind of left behind and, and not 
capitalizing on it. I just want to give people an understanding, since the, the whole webinar series is critical issues facing the higher education sector, that many of our schools are, are really struggling. And at the same time, these are the kinds of innovations that are not nice to have, they're must have. So what's the doomsday scenario if your vision proves correct and the rest of the world moves towards a Campus 2.0 format and my university doesn't? Well, you know, it's funny you say that, Lee. I, I used to have, I mean, I love making slide presentations and pitches. I used to have a slide. Is your university a, 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 an iPhone or a Blackberry? And of course, we, we don't use Blackberries anymore. But, you know, it was like they both sort of did the same thing, but one of them did it so much more effortlessly in an open platform, faster, better, you name it. I think one of the key currencies in, in academia right now is, 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 what is what is the value of my education? Is it, do I get a job? Am I learning skills that 40 years from now I, help me to reinvent myself? Do I have a lifelong love of Bach and Shakespeare? I mean, there are so many issues related to it, but the bottom line is I'm seeing people saying, I, I need employment. I need, especially if my education is expensive, I need to know that I'm going to be able to make that money back. And so. My, I, mean, I grew up on a college campus. I teach at Georgetown. I, I, I love higher education. And so I want to see it thrive. I want to see it succeed. Everybody from the entrepreneur to the Sanskrit professor. And the way to do that is to create a sustainable community that, that one, allows for the resources, but two, creates a target that students see and, and respect. And if, you know, if one school adopts these ideas and it has a healthy, thriving community it's attractive to talent both faculty and students it's creating economic activity and equity in the community around it it's just fun to be there and that's duke and durham right now and there's another community and it's not doing any of those things i won't name names but there are places where you're like it would be hard to go to school here when i know what the other place can be and i also know that if i invest x in my education and i go here i'm going to make dividends on that and if i go there i'm not sure and so I think the downside is just holding on to the old model, thinking sooner or later things will get better. I don't think they'll get better, but I think there are opportunities for all of us to get better. And I, I want to see higher, higher ed not only thrive, but I want to see aspects of it touch the lives of far more than the, the, the 33 to 40 percent of the people that enjoy it. So, so to me, the, the downside is missing the boat and a chance to not only make your institution thrive, but make the community around you thrive as well. Love it. Uh, it's in that spirit that we've provided the, these webinars. Adam, thank you for being a willing leadoff hitter. Uh, this is Adam Glazer from KPMG. This has been Campus 2.0, creating lifelong engagement with alumni. Audience members, thank you for your attendance. Uh, we will be in touch with you in the weeks to come uh, for opportunities for further engagement. Um, but uh, Adam, thank you, and uh, audience members, thank you for uh, your attendance this afternoon. Uh, join us uh, uh, over the next uh, seven weeks. Uh, we have seven more sessions, all at this time, Tuesday, 12 p.m. Uh, and with that, we will adjourn. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Take care, everybody. Bye.